Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to the first plenary lecture of ECR 2023, and thank you for coming this morning. Dr. Sarah Sheard, our plenary lecturer, is a consultant radiologist at Imperial College Healthcare Trust in London in the UK. Sarah graduated from the University of Newcastle, undertook her radiology training in London, and is now head of thoracic imaging at Imperial College. Her subspecialty interest is thoracic imaging, but that's not what we're going to hear today, because in the last couple of years, Sarah has also developed an interest and a passion, indeed, for environmental issues in radiology. She chairs a cross-disciplinary imaging environmental sustainability group in Imperial College, and she's here this morning to tell us about the imperative for us as radiologists to consider sustainability in what we do, and to tell us what we know about this topic, which I think will grow in importance in all our professional lives in the next couple of years. So Sarah, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to have been invited to talk to you all about this really important topic. Um, <clears throat> make my pointer work. Oh, sorry, now I'm going too far. Um, so I think really for me from childhood or very young age, I've been a bit worried about environmental issues and climate change, and I think it's only amplified as the years have gone on. But I've always felt a very sort of strong disparity with the activities that were taking place in my workplace as my work as a junior doctor and then a radiologist. And so when sustainable healthcare started sort of appearing on the agenda, I was... As a radiologist, I was really very interested in finding out where we fit into this picture. So in my talk to you this morning, I'm going to um, talk about the relationship between climate change, health, and healthcare. And then I'm a really strong believer in understanding the background and the basics to any, uh, anything that we're looking at. So I want to clarify some of the concepts and terminology around climate change. And then we're going to use that um, to look at what evidence we have about the environmental impact of radiology and how we can possibly mitigate that. And then, towards the end, we're just going to look at what the future holds. How can we make radiology greener? So what do we need to do? How can we do it? And what are the challenges going to be that will stand in our way? So just to cover climate change and health, so the World Health Organization recognized man-made climate change as the greatest threat to human health. Um, I've just put this World Health Organization uh, diagram up. We won't go into great detail, but um, just to sort of point out how this happens, um, we've got these exposure pathways. Uh, where's my, sorry, pointer. Uh, here, so extreme weather events, heat stress, poor air quality. Um, these will affect um, different groups differently. So there's going to be some certain groups that are much more vulnerable to this based on where they live or background health conditions. And the outcomes are also going to be affected by the ability of the local health systems, their capacity and resilience uh, in the face of climate change. And so the outcomes from climate change are all listed in this box down here at the bottom um, and include injury and mortality from extreme weather events, heat-related stress, respiratory illness, and so on and so forth. But actually, the health systems and facilities are also at risk from the impacts of climate change. Between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from a variety of, of these health outcomes. But along with the World Health Organization, a lot of global medical organizations are beginning to recognize this risk and starting to call on world leaders to act as well as sort of, um, imposing um, change below them into the health systems that they um, are in charge of. And I'd like to commend ECR at this point for putting this on the agenda this year. So the very difficult paradox that we're dealing with is the fact that actually healthcare is very environmentally damaging activity. I think oh, historically this has either just been completely overlooked or perhaps just accepted as an unavoidable consequence of, of our work. So health... Um, accounts for approximately 
4% um, of global greenhouse gas emissions. Financial expenditure and environmental impact tend to be quite closely related, so it's probably not surprising to hear that actually in the United States it's predicted to be up to almost 10% of uh, their greenhouse gas emissions. In Europe it's more around 7 and it's obviously much lower in uh, developing and poorer countries. But healthcare organisations are starting to follow other sectors and putting this on the agenda. And actually our work in the UK has had a massive boost from um, the National Health Service uh, net zero target where they set out a goal to reach net zero by 2040. So then we need to know, what, understand more and know what we need to do. I think one of the problems we have as radiologists and as medics in general is that our training has not covered uh, given us any of the skills that we need to be able to measure um, environmental impact and change that. I think that's starting to change a bit. I know that some medical schools are starting to put sustainable healthcare on the agenda. Um, but I think it's very really important to realise that even with some understanding, we do need the help of outside experts who are also growing in number. Now, we could make radiology net zero or even carbon negative instantly by shutting down operations. We could switch off all the plugs, we could cancel the appointments, we could even send all the unemployed radiologists out on bicycles to plant trees, and it sounds quite appealing sometimes, but actually um, what, we, what we're really aiming for is to maintain the, our standards of excellent clinical care whilst minimising our environmental impact. And then once we get there, once we know what we need to do, we have all the challenges of implementing change in large organisations. So I'm just going to cover a little bit of climate science background. Like I said, I, I like to understand what, what we're doing. So the basic premise of climate change is that human activity, and particularly burning fossil fuels, is causing the release of gases into the atmosphere, which causes sun heat to be trapped, similar to a greenhouse. So the Kyoto Protocol is an international treaty to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and it applies to these seven main gases or groups of gases, which are along the top here. Um, so, so I'll just list them very quickly. Methane, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur hexafluoride, carbon dioxide. Sorry, I'm not very good with my pointer. Oh, hang on. Um, and then I'm going to stop trying to point, but at the top of the, uh, the last few are three groups of gases called the chlorofluorocarbons, which you might remember from refrigerators in the 1980s, perfluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons. Um, so carbon dioxide makes up the greatest proportion of greenhouse gases, it's over 75%. Methane and nitrogen dioxide together um, make up just under 20%. And then the th the, three, the four groups of gases or groups of gases, the F in, are called fluoride, are called the F gases. And they make up less than 5% of the uh, total greenhouse gas emissions, but we're still really interested in the F gases because of something called the global warming potential. So basically different, this is basically just the, how effective a molecule is at causing global heating. So carbon dioxide has a global, is, is actually the least effective one. It has a global warming potential of one. Um, methane, a methane molecule is 25 times more effective than carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth, till you get to the F gases, where some of, some of the gases in the group are up to 22,900 times more effective um, than carbon dioxide at causing global warming. And so greenhouse gas emissions are expressed as a standard unit. Oh, sorry, I keep doing this. I keep pressing the wrong button. Back to where we were. Um, of carbon dioxide equivalents, which you might be familiar with. Um, but if you didn't know, this is basically just a way of expressing any of the greenhouse gases in relation to their global warming potential. So, for example, a ton of methane has a carbon dioxide equivalent of 25, because it's 25 times more effective. And there are some common, this is sort of an aside, but there are some common greenhouse gases that are used in healthcare as pharmaceuticals, particularly anaesthetic agents, and also propellants in uh, inhalers for asthma. And particularly um, desfluorane, which is an anaesthetic gas, which has a global warming potential of, depending on the time frame which you're calculating over, 3,714 
Um, and actually, the National Health Service has just announced that this has been completely phased out of use by the beginning of next year and replaced by lower, um, lower GWP uh, anaesthetic gases. Um, so really quickly, let's just define a carbon footprint because we throw the term around quite a lot. So it's been really nicely defined by um, Professor Mike Berners-Lee, um, which is the sum total of all the greenhouse gas emissions that had to take place in order for a product to be produced or an activity to take place. But it's really important to also remember that there are other forms of environmental damage we can do through our activities, such as extracting raw materials, not something we actually do in the hospital, but we buy things um, that are made of raw materials, um, pollution of water streams, and disposal of our waste products, just as a sort of short list. So if we look, uh, there's another international um, protocol called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which sets out standards for organisations to report their emissions. It all becomes a bit like accountancy, so we're not going to go very far into it. But why it's useful is it just gives us a way of thinking about emissions because it categorises all the sources. So it has things called scopes, which some people may have heard about. They sometimes discuss them on news. Um, and uh, so there are three scopes which are based on the level of influence the organisation has over those emissions. So scope one is direct admissions. So if we're thinking in a hospital setting, the hospital might own vehicles which run on petrol or diesel. The hospital might use um, piped natural gas to burn um, to uh, heat the water for the hospital. So those are emissions that are being generated on site by something the hospital is doing. Indirect emissions mainly purchased electricity. So if your hospital is buying all of its um, electricity from a supplier that runs coal burning power stations, that's going to have very high emissions. If they buy it, and if you live in a country where the renewable energy supply is very good, then it's probably going to be a lot lower. And then finally, um, scope three emissions are our supply chain emissions. This is mainly things that we buy. So, for example, in radiology, that would include uh, personal protective equipment, syringes, the contrast we use, and obviously all our big bits of imaging machinery that we have. And also, actually, employee commuting is con uh, included in this. And supply chain emissions are obviously the hardest control because they're furthest away from our influence, but they're also always, or in most cases, the largest, which is difficult. So we've had a lot of uh, help with, from this useful resource which was published um, when setting out the targets for the National Health Service in the UK to reach net zero. Um, it gives a really nice detailed categorisation and breakdown of the emissions from healthcare in the UK, which is probably very translatable to certainly work across the rest of Europe. Um, and then um, gives us a breakdown of emissions as well. I'm just going to cover this very quickly. So you can see in the first figure, got all these little icons. So these are all the different sources of emissions. Um, so for example, we've got our anaesthetic gases as well, again, that we've spoken about, electricity, and then specific to radiology, we've got medical devices, and we've got computers. It's all in there. Um, and so they have then grouped those into these big colored arrows, um, which um, are the greenhouse gas protocol scopes that we've just covered. Um, and then the authors actually added a fifth arrow, I'm trying to point at it, um, which is outside of the standard greenhouse gas protocol scopes. It includes patient and visitor travel. Because actually they felt that what we do in the hospital, the way we structure our services, can have a huge influence over this. I mean, you could ban patients have, having visitors and then there'd be no visit travel. So we, we've actually got a lot of influence. It sounds a bit harsh, but just for an example. Um, and, um, but then what they've also done is, for the purposes of the organisation reaching net zero, they've grouped, they've sort of superimposed this white box. So they actually felt that regardless of the scope, all of these little icons that we've got inside this white box are quite actually under quite a lot of influence um, from the hospital activity. So that's the NHS carbon footprint. Everything outside is the carbon footprint plus. Um, and we'll see why that's sort of helpful to us in imaging in a second. Um, and then we've just got this pie chart, and I just want to make a few really quick points about this. So, first of all, the green sort of slice here is just the scope one emission, so the NHS carbon footprint. Um, 
well, I scope one, two, and a bit of three, actually, but it's only 25% only of the emissions are from these activities that are under our direct control. What I really like about this, because it's a bit of a hot topic of mine at the moment, is they've grouped together all the travel. So staff commuting, patients traveling, visitors traveling into one slice, which actually amounts to 10% of the total emissions of healthcare in the United Kingdom. And then, as promised, the scope three emissions are the biggest. So um, over 60% of emissions are from scope three. So when we start to think about how, how do we even begin to look at imaging and what our footprint is, um, we actually thought, because we're a National Health Service organisation and our trust has got commitments, um, it would make an enormous amount of sense to just align ourselves with, with this um, NHS model. So we basically transposed it very simply into an imaging carbon footprint, and that's uh, activities that are directly under our influence, all that of our hospitals, because we do like to go and bother people to do things, even if it's not under our direct imaging control. Um, and then Imaging Carbon Footprint Plus, which is activities that are outside our control, but we can have influence over. And then we added this third category, which is also set out in this paper, talking about sustainable models of care. So how we configure and deliver health services to reduce our environmental impact. And I think this is a very interesting one. So then we just started listing everything we could possibly think of in, that happens in our department and put it into the right boxes. So I'm just going to go through this quickly just to clarify what all these areas are. So um, under the first in the first um, column, procurement, so what do we buy, how much of it do we buy, um, how do we dispose of our waste, um, how much energy do we use, how energy efficient are we. Um, where, do we, what do, where do we buy our energy from? And could we even think about generating it on site on the hospital in some small um, degree? What other resources are we using, such as water? Are our administrative processes paper-free? Um, do we switch off our computers overnight? Are we told not to switch our computers off overnight because of software updates? That's sort of something that's been um, troubling us for a while, but we now have a solution. And then I think this is a really huge one, which we don't actually know very much about yet, but what's the environmental impact of the years and years and years and years worth of an ever-growing imaging library <laughs> that the hospitals store? We can't see it, and so it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. And then how do our staff travel to work? How do they get around if they need to travel between sites during the day? And then finally, how efficient are the buildings we work in? How are they heated? How are they cooled, ventilated, lit, maintained? All of those aspects. <coughs> in our Imaging Carbon Footprint Plus, um, this is activities that are outside our control, but we can influence. So whenever you purchase anything into the hospital, you have to remember that for that product to reach you, there's been extraction of raw materials, there's been a number of manufacturing processes, and then there's all the transportation that has gone into that. So by the time the delivery truck pulls up outside your hospital, those items all have a really big carbon footprint, whether they're a pair of gloves or whether they're an MRI scanner. Um, so we need to sort of start considering that. And then also, again, patients travel. How do the patients get to the hospital? How often do they need to come to the hospital for treatment and investigation? And then in this sustainable model of care column, um, looking at where, where, where patients have to, you know, where does our activity take place? Um, how do patients get there? Are we using <coughs> telemedicine and teleradiology the best effect to avoid having to move people around? Um, there's quite a big initiative in the United Kingdom at the moment called Getting It Right First Time, which is mainly a clinical um, pathway improvement, but actually along with that, allowing earlier and faster diagnosis using the correct test the first time round, um, and allowing for earlier and less intensive treatment. And when I say less intensive, that's less clinically intensive if patients have very advanced conditions that haven't been diagnosed, but also tends to be less environmentally intensive as well. <coughs> and sort of, uh, you know, in the same vein, reducing overdiagnosis, not doing unnecessary tests. The greenest scan is the scan that you don't have. And so I've stolen that from a surgeon who was talking about preventative medicine, saying actually the greenest operation is the operation you don't need to have. Um, so we should be thinking about that. <coughs> so
So we're just going to look at a little bit of work um, done by some of our radiology colleagues from around the globe on environmental <coughs> sustainability. I want to show you these first, um, just to um, look very briefly at the methodology for measuring carbon footprint. We've sort of done a little bit already, but then it will really give us an opportunity to look at the evidence we have about our impact in imaging. So starting off, this is a paper from an American team, an interventional radiologist, who used uh, something called the life cycle analysis method to calculate the volume of greenhouse gas emissions that were generated by interventional radiology procedures. So their flow chart is here. So this black line around the edge, which I'm not tracing very well, is the boundaries of the study. So the patients travel in from left to right. The resources travel through the interventional radiology suite from top to bottom. We've got four different areas in the dotted line, so the intake, procedure room, recovery, and control room. And all the little coloured boxes are all the different um, resources that have um, associated emissions. So a little bit like all those icons that we saw in the NHS um, model. And so they just, again, like we did, did a really big inventory of all these emissions sources, but then, um, then used a hybrid approach to calculate the emissions from all of these things. So it's difficult, um, for example, to exactly measure all the electricity that every single machine in the room is using. So most groups doing projects like this will have to look at the machine power specifications, calculate how long everything was switched on for, and calculate it that way. Um, they did weigh the waste that they were throwing away at the end of the day and use some commercially available databases to measure the emissions from all the different processes that go into that. So you have to sort of put together lots of different methods. What they found, <coughs> um, so they covered a week of daytime procedures in interventional radiology. Um, the case mix was very representative of their normal practice. Um, the things they didn't include in, in their, within the boundaries of their study was the post-operative care of the patient. So once they'd left recovery, they didn't look any further than that. And they didn't include the patients traveling to the hospital for the procedure. So you can just see the, the results table. Um, let me get my pointer to move. Um, and so here, uh, just above the red line, are the total greenhouse gas emissions um, in carbon dioxide equivalent from everything that they measured. Now, in the red box, heat HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And that accounted for 49% um, of the total emissions from having an interventional radiology procedure. That was very closely followed by the single-use disposable equipment that they used in the interventional radiology suite, which accounted for 41%. So that's the production and delivery of those single-use items. Um, a really interesting thing they found was actually 52% of the energy used for heating, ventilation, and cooling was outside of the working hours. <coughs> And I just, just put a little circle around at the bottom, so Siva fluorine is one of the lower uh, global warming potential uh, anaesthetic agents that you can use, which they're obviously using in their department. <coughs> um, this is another study from an Australian group <coughs> who wanted to look at the carbon footprint. Um, they did a life cycle analysis to, to compare the carbon footprint of five most common imaging modalities used in the hospital. So they did MRI, CT, ultrasound, um, and then two different types of plain film. Their boundaries are a little bit different, and I think this is interesting. They wanted, and I don't know whether it's specifically because they're in Australia, so sort of the climate is quite extreme, but um, they didn't include the heating and ventilation um, and, and air conditioning because they wanted it to be very translatable to anybody, to, uh, information for anybody to use regardless of what season it was, whereabouts they were. Um, <coughs> But what they did find is that a huge proportion of the energy use by all of the machinery that they measured was from standby mode, so outside, of work, so outside of active scanning. So if you just look at the red box here, so above active scanning time in CT, if we go down the line, used a total of 278 kilowatt hours of electricity compared with 927 in active standby and 280 in the passive standby, which is the lower sleep mode. That's very closely mirrored in their MRI and ultrasound work. <coughs> I'm just really quickly going to touch on <coughs> some of the work that we've done at Imperial College recently, and this is in, in a poster which is presented here. 
Um, we also wanted to look at the carbon footprint of having a CT scan at one of our hospitals. But because we've got some upcoming changes in terms of delivering imaging in more community-based hubs rather than patients having to travel into central tertiary hospitals, we wanted to prepare our model for being able to compare the before and after of this change, so the sustainable models of care that I was talking about. So in our uh, emissions inventory, we included patient travel and staff travel in our scope three. <coughs> Um, and this is just quite a simple pie chart to show you what our results were. Um, scope 3 emissions, again, absolutely by far the greatest. And if we break those down, the big orange box is patients' journey to the hospital. And that was actually not 60% not of scope 3, but 60% of the total emissions from having a CT scan at a central London hospital were due to the patient's journey to and from the hospital. <coughs> And then I'm just going to uh, talk about some, some practical housekeeping things, which I think uh, Dem shows us a lot of things that we need to know about how we're going to make these changes. So we've got some very good and engaged radiographers <coughs> in our hospitals and working in CT. And they wanted to, they sort of identified that they thought waste was being quite incorrectly disposed of <coughs> in, in the CT scanner. So I'm just going to have a drink. Um, so I'm sure many people are familiar with this bit of equipment, even if they don't know how to operate it. If you've got any radiographers in the room, they're probably better equipped. But this is a CT contrast pump. <coughs> and so a bottle of contrast gets put in here, connected to the pump via a bit of tubing, which is called the day set, apparently. And then um, the pump then connects to the patient via a bit of tubing called the patient set, which is here, and that goes onto the patient's intravenous cannula. And what was happening in CT was any time any bit of this equipment had reached the end of its use because the bottle was empty or the day set needed changing, it's all going into the yellow bin, which is the sharps and infectious waste bin. So that is designed for things that are sharp, things that are contaminated by infective patients or for cytotoxic drugs. And it's the, it's the highest impact. It's the most expensive waste to dispose of for the hospital, but it's also got the highest carbon footprint and 1.85 tonnes of carbon dioxide are emitted for every tonne of waste that's disposed of. So <laughs> they felt that there were probably alternative waste streams that might be more appropriate for the various components involved in this and, and embarked on a long journey of making lots of friends in the hospital with the waste manager, the clinical waste contracting um, company, they spoke to the municipal recycling team, they spoke to the contrast suppliers, there were a lot of emails and a lot of clarification went on and in the end it got to the point where it was established that actually this little plastic spike is the only bit that needs to go into this yellow bin. All of this plastic tubing can go into the non-infectious offensive waste stream. And actually, we were very surprised to find out from the clinical waste um, company that this is actually a carbon negative waste stream because when they burn it, they use the heat to generate electricity. And they're also able to salvage some metals and things from the ash afterwards. I haven't actually sort of corroborated that as the case, but that's the information that we're being given. And they're subject to all the same sort of reporting standards as anyone else. <coughs> when it comes to the contrast bottle, what we can actually do is, um, when there's a little bit left over which isn't enough to use for the next patient, that now gets recycled. So it goes into, I can't point, the big orange, big um, white tub with the blue lid. Um, that's collected and gets sent back to the contrast supplier for recycling. The bottles get rinsed and the labels are taken off and they just go into the domestic recycling stream. <coughs> So I wanted to show you this, and this is the nice project, uh, the poster that Sam made to one of the radio crews put up uh, next to the bins just to make everyone aware of what needed to go where. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you this because it highlights the complexity of something that we just do all the time, which is disposing of waste in hospitals. The complexity is quite off-putting. Off I think often people are just a bit they lack confidence to separate things, and I think they're worried about risking contaminating a waste stream by putting something, the wrong thing in there, and therefore they take the safest route, which is to put everything in the highest sort of clinical hazard, but also in sort of carbon footprint stream. 
And I think we need much more clear instruction about what we should be doing, and probably lots more quite hard projects like this, but that have huge impact. Um, it also really illustrated the importance of having a network, and I can't really emphasize this enough. You know, the team in the department, but also finding people who could help us with information. They were interested, and they were engaged, and actually quite happy that we were taking an interest in their specialist area. So um, it was a very, very positive process from that respect. And the results were a 98% reduction in the use of yellow bins in a unit of just two CT scanners. Um, and it was projected to save about 10,000 pounds, so just over 11,000 euros per year. And 20,513 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. But it needs policing. It's difficult to make sure people are continuing with that practice. You know, this is a worthwhile, this is a worthwhile activity because healthcare account, uh, waste accounts for 5% of healthcare emissions. So we know that sustainable healthcare probably saves money, might make a better patient experience. Um, and is better for the environment. So what's stopping us from doing it already? So I just want to think about what the challenges are that we face. Why, why is this not happening? I think just reflecting on um, what's going on in the workplace, I think sometimes um, we're very busy in the workplace. Depending where you work, we're quite short on staff, or we might have high staff turnover, and there might not be time to train people outside of those sort of essential patient safety and clinical topics. And then you actually need people who've got the time to monitor these processes to make sure that we're doing it properly. And I think this follows on very sort of smoothly into how do we change behaviours, how do we engage people and empower them to be making the sort of right choices at work. Um, I think another huge challenge we have is, you know, we've seen the impact from heating and cooling our departments. It's probably the biggest impact we make, actually. Um, but this is very difficult if we're working in old, inefficient buildings. And I think as new healthcare facilities are built, we're going to have to build them to a very high environmental standard. Um, imaging Carbon Footprint Plus, I've kept them in these columns. Um, Circularity, I haven't really talked about circularity, but it's basically it's the linear economy is one where raw materials are extracted, they're manufactured, they're used, and then they're disposed of. Circularity is all, all the re's, so recycling, repurposing, repairing, remanufacturing, um, all of that, which stops you from requiring more raw materials and stops things from having to go to waste. Um, and then also, uh, Understanding how to use our machines in the most uh, energy efficient ways, I think we could do with, and also can we, um, yeah, we don't, we don't always do that properly, I, I think. Um, sorry, there was a point I wanted to make about circularity. Circularity for clinical things is more difficult because of concern around safety and contamination, um, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, and then in, in sustainable models of care, it's you know, very difficult. Patients have often got access to multiple hospitals. They might have multiple tests because we're not sharing information very well. Um, are we supporting our clinicians well enough to make sure they're requesting the, right, the, the correct study, which is going to answer the clinical question the first time around, rather than a patient bouncing around having multiple tests with each of their own carbon footprint before they actually have the one that answers the question? And are we using our scanners to the maximum capacity? If, if we use them more efficiently, we might make a better use of the, the heat energy that's going into heating and cooling the rooms. Um, we might reduce the idle time, which also uses a lot of energy. And dare I say it, we might need to buy fewer scanners, but it might not be a popular view. <laughs> um, so if you were here hoping for something a bit more exciting than turning down the air conditioning, I thought we'd have a little um, think about more innovative ways um, that we could make imaging more sustainable. So we've seen that we've got some, we've got some evidence about um, the environmental impact of all the different imaging modalities. So perhaps we've got a question, a diagnostic question that we can answer by two tests. Should we just select the one with the lower carbon footprint? Um, on days when it's very windy and very sunny in a lot of countries, the renewable the um, proportion of renewable energy in the supply is very high. Perhaps we should look at the weather forecast and just get all our non-urgent patients in on really windy days and book the lists from sort of dawn to dusk. I think 
probably what's more likely to happen is that energy supplies are going to become much better at um, storing any excess energy produced on those days. Um, but it's quite a fun, fun idea. Um, will the ever in, you know, we, we know the impact of all the single use items and consumables we have and the disposal of them. Perhaps as imaging gets ever, ever better, we'll be able to sort of reduce or even completely remove the need to use, use these things. <coughs> There's a uh, team in the Netherlands that did a really nice paper looking at iodinated contrast agents in, in water pollution um, and um, how we can prevent, prevent that happening. So they obviously end reach through the sewage. So see contrast recycling is one way because we're not just tipping the leftovers down the drain, but they were also looking at urine collection from patients before they leave the hospital. Um, and then this is another really big thing and I think quite a serious issue. When, when we're buying a new piece of equipment, for example, a, a new scanner, we're very interested in the cost, we're interested in the specifications, we want to know what apps the te you know, they're going to throw in for us. But actually, what, we, what I'd love to see is um, a, a sort of, um, comparable way of finding out what the carbon footprint is of the manufacturer, what the running sort of energy consumption is going to be, or you know, knock-on effects like how cold does the room need to be, and also what's going to happen to that? Is there a plan for what's going to happen to it when we're finished with it, when it reaches the end of its life? So almost there. <laughs> I just want to really zoom out on, on everything we've just covered, which is a lot. Um, I think proportionality is really important. If we're interested in sustainability, it's worth trying to focus on the things that are going to have the biggest impact. And so what we've learned from what we've looked at um, is that moving people around transportation and changing the temperature of room air um, contribute the most to our overall imaging carbon footprint. As I've, I've gone on and on about can we reconfigure our services, can we improve our efficiency. It's nice that, you know, it's... But delivering care sustainably has got lots of knock-on positive effects. You know, like I said, it's cheaper. If we're offering scans to patients close to their homes in the community, it might improve the quality, it might improve access to healthcare. Um, and also, you know, reducing travel, reduce air pollution, and the impact that has on respiratory diseases. So it, it's, it's all good. Um, but the message I want to say is actually behavioral change is one of our greatest challenges. So. Don't be, you know, don't be put off doing something small because anything that you start to do, which just starts to normalise and start the discussion in your department and empowers people around you, is going to be very valuable. Um, so I've just made a really quick list of things that you can start doing when you get home. So think about whether you need to open single-use items or whether you can just have them there in case you need them. I think we often will open a number of syringes because we might need them, but. So again, you know, it's a valuable thing to do. Think about joining an iodine recycling program, just contract your supplier. Um, and quite a lot of hospitals now are using uh, energy saving software that just goes around overnight, switching off the computers, powering them up again if they need to do a software update, and it's saving them a lot of money, especially this year. <laughs> and then in future, perhaps we should be asking our um, service uh, engineers, you know, can we make the room a bit warmer overnight? Does it need to be this cold? Are we running our machines most effectively? We can start asking them um, these questions. Have a look at the waste stream. We've seen the huge impact it has. It's a bit of work, but it's like, uh, you know, it's impactful and actually it's very accessible and tangible for people. It's something people do at home, and I think lots of people feel frustrated they're not doing it in the workplace. And then finally, get a team together, network, share your ideas, start educating your colleagues, and use our position as clinicians to sort of campaign. I'm always doing this, it's my favorite thing to do. You know, bothering the chief executives, why aren't we doing this? And actually, you know, they probably are all under pressure. They've, this has appeared on their agenda, and they're going to be pleased that someone is doing something, and so they'll probably, you'll probably have their ear. So thank you very much. Uh, oh yeah, I just put that star there because that's what I wanted industry to help us with. Um, <laughs> oh, 
thank you, Dr. Sheard. I, I think for everybody in the room, there are things there, as you said at the, at the end of your talk, that we can go home and do tomorrow. We don't necessarily have to wait for people to tell us how to do these things to improve the sustainability of our practices. So congratulations. Uh, I'd like to present you with the certificate for uh, the